moving. Hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone joining to today's um, live Q&A session with Dr. Maria Vankerkov about uh, COVID-19 updates. Um, as usual, if you're watching us on Twitter, please use, use the hashtag AskWHO to send us your questions. And if you're watching us on other platforms, we will monitor comment section, and I will pass, again, questions to Maria to answer, um, especially as we reached a tragic milestone of 1 million reported COVID-19 deaths in this year alone. Um, so Maria, how concerning is this for you before we go on, on viewers questions? Well, it's quite concerning um, given that we're at the end of August um, this year and more than a million people have died just this year alone. So as you know, we've had more than 6 million reported deaths to WHO since the beginning of this pandemic. Um, and given we're in the third year of the pandemic, it's not only tragic that we've lost so many lives this year alone, it's, it's all the more so tragic given that we have tools that actually can prevent these deaths from occurring in the first place. Um, I think for us at WHO, our goal is to end this emergency in, in every country on the planet. And that means being able to manage COVID-19 as a manageable disease where people are not dying from that. And we can do that. Um, that's the positive, is that we can do that with the tools that exist, with early access to diagnostics, with early access to therapeutics and vaccines, first and foremost. And for us, this tragic milestone is, is heartbreaking. Um, these are people. I think a lot of us have become numb to the numbers of hearing 14,000 deaths a week, 15,000 deaths a week, 1 million deaths. Um, these numbers are, are really hard to comprehend. These are people, these are parents, these are kids, these are sisters, these are friends. Um, and each one of these lives lost is tragic. So we are doing everything that we can to continue to fight against this virus that is circulating so intensely around the world and use the tools we can most effectively so that we can end this pandemic. Thank you, Maria. And uh, it's really sad to really think about how many lives have been lost, how many families have been impacted, societies and everything. Um, and as we're seeing this increase in that in, in recent weeks, uh, can you please uh, walk us through what is the um, situation with transmission and cases in different parts of the world? Yeah, so, you know, it is a mixed picture around the world. And um, again, given we're in the third year of this pandemic, we see differences in transmission dynamics around the world. So in recent weeks, we have started to see a decline in case reports to WHO, but this is in the backdrop of changing surveillance policies, changes in testing. And so we know that there are many more cases that are circulating than are actually being reported to WHO. And this is because um, not only has PCR testing reduced, but self-testing, you know, the test that people do at home has increased but that's not captured in surveillance systems. So we know the virus is circulating intensely. Um, and there are some differences around the world. Lately, what we've been seeing in the Western Pacific region in, in Asia and in the Pacific Islands, we've seen many countries that over the last two years have done a really incredible job of keeping the virus at bay, not allowing that virus to really take hold in populations to really start to be overcome by Omicron mm -hmm. and the latest subvariants that are circulating. So we're seeing some sharp increases in um, islands across the Pacific. Um, we've seen some increases in Japan, for example. And that is to be expected in countries around the world, not just in Asia and the Pacific, where we see the relaxation of public health and social measures, the relaxation of wearing masks or the recommendation to wear masks in indoor spaces where you don't have good ventilation on public transport, for example. Um, reducing um, recommendations for distancing, for staying home if you're unwell, for avoiding crowds. All of those have an impact on how this virus will circulate between people. So we do see this virus circulating really intensely around the world. 
Um, and in the last seven days alone, we had another 5.3 million cases reported. These are huge numbers, and that's an underestimate. On deaths, in terms of deaths, we've already talked about this milestone of a million deaths this year. Um, we should highlight that the impact of this virus is not just in the deaths that are reported, it's also in the people that are requiring hospitalization. So as the virus increases in transmission, we will see more hospitalizations, we will see more people needing ad, uh, admission to intensive care, and we will see more people dying. And that's what we what is being reflected in the case report so far. So with deaths, um, we've seen, we did see a reduction week by week, but there were still more than 14,000 people that died last week alone. And we saw an increase in deaths in our Western Pacific region, in our Eastern Mediterranean region, and in the African region. So it's a mixed picture in terms of deaths. Um, but I did want to just make one last point on this sort of tragic milestone. It's we've seen this virus take people's lives, but we've also seen this virus take people's livelihoods and completely change the course of people's futures. So there's that's all the more reason, not just to prevent the death, which is so critical when we can do that with the tools that we have. We need to take measures to reduce the spread so that we reduce the impact, which is having an impact on people's lives and livelihoods. So a lot to be done. We're, we're quite sober today in terms of our reporting of this. We're optimistic because we have tools that exist, but we need a reality check. You know, we really need to once again take stock of where we are. We should not be in a position with 14 or 15,000 people dying every week. We just shouldn't. Thank you, Maria, and uh, I, I, I fully agree with you, and I'm sure that our viewers as well. Um, and the speaking of this uh, high uh, rates of deaths per week, 15, 14,000, um, and that Omicron and its subvariants are dominant uh, in recent months in, in driving transmission. So do you think that the increase in deaths uh, is the result because those subvariants are becoming more severe or, or causing more severe disease and that, or they're, they're, the other factors are causing this increase in deaths? So it's a good question. So we're constantly looking at the variants of concern and the subvariants that are circulating globally. Um, and of the sequences that have been shared um, with platforms like Jusaid, uh, almost 100% of those are Omicron. In fact, 99% of the sequences mm -hmm. that have been shared in recent weeks are Omicron, of which about 83% of those are the sublineage BA.5. So this is Omicron as a variant of concern, sublineage BA.5, um, which is circulating uh, around the world as the dominant subvariant circulating. When you have increased transmissibility, and we do see an increase in transmission with each of the subvariants um, that are emerging and that are becoming dominant, that makes sense because either they wouldn't be dominant uh, worldwide. When you have an increase in transmission, you will have an increase in hospitalization. Mm -hmm. And if you have an increase in hospitalization, the risk of death increases. The good news is that we have antivirals now, we have vaccines that are preventing severe disease and death, but we really are missing a large proportion of the world um, that have not even received their primary vaccine dosage. The DG said yesterday that a third of the world's population remains unvaccinated. And if we look at low income countries, two thirds of health workers are not vaccinated and three quarters of older adults in low income countries are not vaccinated. This will drive mortality. This will drive morbidity and mortality. And this is what we really need to address. But there are many subvariants of Omicron that are circulating. And even of the subvariants of BA.5, there's a dozens of further subvariants of BA.5 that are circulating. So this is something we need to watch. Um, when we look at the factors of each of these subvariants, transmission is one, severity is another. So I mentioned that increased transmissibility means more hospitalizations, more deaths. But we're also looking at the intrinsic value of each of these subvariants. We have not seen that BA.5 is more severe or causes more severe disease compared to the other subvariants, but this is something that we're actively monitoring. And it's complicated three years into this pandemic when testing is reduced, sequencing is reduced. And that means our ability as the World Health Organization and with our partners um, to analyze, um, to assess, to discuss, to debate is reduced because we don't have the data we need. So we really need surveillance to be maintained. We need sequencing to be maintained. We need good geographic representation of sequences around the world. We need those sequences to be shared with platforms like GISAID so that the scientists around the world can actively look at severity. 
Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite a complicated picture, um, but Omicron is dominant and Omicron BA.5 is dominant worldwide. Thank you so much, Maria. We're getting similar question from viewers on Facebook and on LinkedIn. Um, I believe as a follow up, as you said, one uh, third of the world is unvaccinated and mostly in lower and low income countries. So question is, what is the WHO's plan to mitigate COVID in developing countries? Um, or the, somebody asked in specific uh, in rural areas um, and are we working in local organizations to prevent transmission in villages? I mean, uh, starting with the last part of that question, which is the right part, you know, how are we working with communities? We know that mm -hmm. communities are the source of how we deal with, how we prevent outbreaks from occurring, but also how we deal with mm -hmm. outbreaks coming up with co-design. We can write the recommendations and say, please do this, but how we implement them needs to be done with communities, not said to communities, but developed with and implemented with communities so that they are tailored and that they are adapted to the communities that are most at risk. Um, there's many aspects to dealing with, with COVID. You know, first we want to prevent infections in the first place. And a lot of that is these simple measures, you know, that we've been recommending, wearing of a mask, distancing, improving ventilation, spending more time outdoors. It is difficult to do that in some contexts where people are in quite crowded situations, but that's where the use of masks, for example, comes into play um, much more prominently. But vaccination remains really, really critical in terms of our efforts to control COVID to reduce severe disease, to prevent deaths. And we are urgently asking all countries to assess the vaccination coverage in their countries. Look at who you're missing. Our priorities of the highest priorities are older adults, our health workers, our people who are immunocompromised. Those individuals in all countries, um, and there are people in these categories that are missed in every country, including high income countries, that need to be targeted for the full dose doses that are recommended, the primary series, plus any boosters that are recommended per national policies. That is really, really critical. Then looking at high risk groups, which we have adults with comorbidities, pregnant persons, teachers and other health, uh, other essential workers, and disadvantaged populations. Um, and there are disadvantaged populations in every country. And then work down in terms of priorities. But reaching those vaccination targets in communities, working with communities is key. Understanding the barriers for, for vaccination and trying to overcome them and working with communities on addressing those is also critical. What are the reasons why people aren't getting vaccinated? Is it, is it a refusal to get vaccinated? Is it they just aren't being reached in the healthcare systems that they have there? Um, and then making sure that we have targeted immunization campaigns. Once we know who we're missing, how do we reach those who are most at risk? How do we work with communities to reach those most at risk? Because vaccines are saving lives, including against Omicron and all of the subvariants that are circulating. So according to the policies that are in your country, whatever is recommended for you based on your age, based on your underlying conditions, please get vaccinated and get those booster doses as recommended. Whatever the vaccine is available, take that vaccine to get, uh, to get vaccinated and they work. Um, even the vaccines um, that have been used since the beginning of this pandemic, which is uh, based on the ancestral lineage, the original virus, um, works incredibly well at preventing severe disease and death. Thank you so much, Maria. And maybe we can just as well at this point mention booster doses mm -hmm. and, and how boosters um, are effective against those subvariants of Omicron that are circulating mostly. Yeah, so we have, I mean, again, given that this has been three years mm -hmm. now that we're into this, um, a lot of people receive vaccines maybe a year, maybe a year and a half ago. They received their first dose, their second dose, depending on the, the vaccine that they had. Um, and certain populations that are at a higher risk of developing severe disease have been recommended to get a booster dose, an additional dose. So we've made our recommendations out through SAGE um, on, on the use of booster doses. We will need bo booster doses going forward because the virus will continue to circulate. And we have what is known as waning immunity. And so people will need to be boosted in terms of building up their immune profile to prevent against severe disease. And also don't forget that most of the world, you know, has been exposed to this virus. So many people have additionally been infected with um, SARS-CoV-2 and that will also prime 
the system, you know, prime your immune system for that. So boosting will become important, is important as we go forward, particularly for those who are most at risk of developing severe disease. So again, wherever you live, wherever you are watching this, look up what the recommendations are for you and for your family members and make sure that you receive those recommended doses. This is what will prevent you requiring hospitalization or even needing hospitalization. Um, and it will keep you alive. You know, vaccines are keeping people alive. They're saving lives. Thank you, Maria. And uh, as we are looking into, you you said just before we started, your, your kids are going back to school next week. And mm -hmm. we know that in many parts of the world, children are, the, the year, the school year is restarting. Um, and we also in the Northern Hemisphere expect uh, colder weather to come again so that we will be spending more time indoors. So, um, what uh, can we do uh, in preparing for those times to limit trans transmission, to protect our children, but also yeah. to protect the, the vulnerable? So it, it's similar to what we had been recommending in the past. I mean, I should say hello to my kids. I meant to say hello to them the last time we did the live Q&A. Um, but it, this is an incredibly um, exciting time of year for parents and for, and for kids who are going back to school. They're really excited about that start of that school year. And what we need to do to protect our kids is to protect each other, right? So first and foremost, the virus circulates in the community. So everything that we can do within the community to reduce the spread, that's where we start. Um, so getting vaccinated, you know, taking simple measures to reduce your potential exposure to this virus. Self-testing is really helpful. Within schools, schools are, um, they've had a couple of years now to deal with COVID-19 and many schools have put into place provisions to try to prevent the spread. Um, distancing in schools, improving ventilation within the schools, as simple as opening windows, but some schools have, schools have also invested in, in, in improving ventilation, and we would recommend that in buildings where people live, where people work, where people study, and that includes in schools. Making sure that teachers are vaccinated, and in many countries, there is vaccine that is recommended for children um, and adolescents, so again, follow the national guidance for that and, and, and receive the vaccines, get the kids vaccinated. Um, for those of you who live in countries that have access to vaccines or ample access to vaccines, again, this is not the same around the world, but we really do need kids in school um, for their education, um, for their security, for their development, um, for, you know, in many, in many countries, it's where children receive food um, and just sort of that mental nourishment that they need. So it's really important that kids get back to school. Um, there are the use of masks in some schools, especially where the virus is circulating and, and if the, the kids are of the right age. Um, there's disinfection that can happen, a lot of different measures that can be put in place. And many countries and schools also have plans. Um, if they are to detect a case, what does it mean? Uh, what do you need to do as a, as a parent of children? Um, how do you keep your kids safe if they're feeling unwell? Remember, COVID-19 is not the only thing that is circulating. So in the Northern Hemisphere, we will be approaching the autumn uh, months um, and we will see influenza circulate. We will see RSV circulate. We will see other pathogens circulate. So hand hygiene remains important, not just for COVID, but for many other pathogens mm -hmm. that circulate. So it's that do it all. You don't have to do everything all at the same time, but washing your hands, disinfecting your hands, wearing of a mask, informing your kids, talk to your kids. Talk to them about what the current risk is in the area that you live in and what they can do to be part of the solution. Again, young people are sort of, well, they are our future, um, but they can offer novel approaches to helping us all deal with COVID-19. Thank you so much, Maria. And maybe be, be, before we close, there were, there were a few questions about um, how to approach when people are having concerns over vaccination or vaccines, their safety and effectiveness, even if they have access, but also in some areas, uh, some of our viewers mentioned that people are doubting uh, the severity and threat of COVID-19. So maybe, as you mentioned, the young people can help us with solutions and new ideas. Um, but what are your views on how we can overcome those barriers in the response? Well, it's a good question. I can turn the question back on you because I know you do a lot of work in this area, but it's about having access to accurate information. There is a lot of misinformation and disinformation that is circulating out there. So first and foremost, know your, the source of where you're getting that information. Um, as a child, as a young person, even as an adult, go to trusted sources where you know this information is based on science, it's based on evidence, and it's based on keeping you safe. Um, and, and knowing that science changes over time and that recommendations change over time, 
None of us have all of the answers, um, but we're doing our best to provide timely, accurate, updated information. Um, and if you're passing information to others, make sure you're passing accurate information to others. Sometimes you might know, ask a health provider, ask your parent, ask a teacher. Um, go to someone that you trust to say, is this reliable? Um, and of course, as you know, we're working with the different platforms on social media, um, through the internet and all of the different types of technologies and platforms to ensure that accurate information is circulating. Um, because knowledge is power, you know, just as a mask can prevent onward transmission or a vaccine can save your life, information, good information can also save your life and bad information can kill. And so this is just as important. We talked a couple of years ago, it's a couple of years ago now about this toolkit. I think of my son going to school with his backpack and thinking of all of the different things he can carry with him to get through the school day. Think about that with COVID-19. What is your risk of exposure? What is your risk of infection where you live? And what do you need to do to live your life, you know, go about your life, um, you know, make a living, provide for your family, be social with others, but keep yourself safe. And there's a lot of things that you can do yourself. We need everybody to contribute. We need everybody to be part of the solution. Unfortunately, this pandemic is not over. We can end this pandemic while living our lives. We just need to put a little extra thought into that of being a bit more careful. A lot of people are talking about living with COVID, but we need to live with this responsibly. A million deaths this year is not living with COVID. Having 15,000 deaths per week is not living with COVID-19 responsibly. So we need to manage this disease. The virus is not going away, unfortunately, but we have so many tools, so many tools that we can use every single day um, that will keep us safe and keep our loved ones safe. And just lastly, please don't forget to be kind to others. There's a lot of things that we are facing out there. COVID is just one, but many people are living in conflict zones. Many people are dealing with so many other diseases that are circulating. We have monkeypox circulating, There's a lot of fear and uncertainty. Please be kind to one another. If someone is wearing a mask, they're wearing that mask for a reason. Be supportive of them. Don't question them. They may be living with someone who's vulnerable. They may be vulnerable themselves. Let's just really make an extra effort to be kind to one another because, I mean, that's all we have is the solidarity of sort of getting through this. And we'll get through this. We just, it's going to take a little bit more time. Thank you so much, Maria, um, for this also encouragement message on a Friday afternoon, mm -hmm. a Friday afternoon for us, evening for some, or morning ahead of the weekend. And also when people hopefully will spend time with loved ones and gathering. So a reminder on how to be kind and supportive of each other, but also to protect each other from this virus. And speaking of solidarity, um, I'm grateful to our viewers from many countries for their solidarity with us and being today and asking their questions from Senegal, Mexico, Pakistan, India, the US, Ethiopia, Cameroon, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Lebanon, Indonesia, Poland, Nigeria, Uganda, Sierra Leone, Italy, Ghana, Kenya, Chad, Thailand, Burkina Faso, and many others. Um, so we had quite a bit of viewers. Um, thank you so much for being with us and please follow Maria's advice on how to uh, stay vigilant and protect each other and yourself. Goodbye.